Hemat was full in paper one, and we got a lot of questions in paper two as well. We got a question on the most common inheritable cause of uh, coagulation defects. That's going to be von Willebrand disease. And uh, the question was not about a true statement, but about a false statement. So we understand that type one, type two, type three. The type three is the most severe because it is having very low levels. Absolutely true. Type two is the one which is a functional defect. There is no change in the levels as such. But type one is going to be an example of a mild disease. It's a commonest. It is autosomal dominant. It is a mild disease. So that was a false statement that we need to just have an understanding. We got two questions in the exam on B12 deficiency. One was a direct question, paper one, which talked about a patient having had a history of a partial gastrectomy. And the question was asking about the nutrient deficiency, which is likely to be seen in this patient, right? So the answer was obvious. Parietal cell depletion is responsible for causing a development of B12 deficiency. We got a question in the second session, which talked about a patient having an undergone an ileal surgery. And then the question was asking about which of the following is not seen as a feature. So B12 deficiency would be associated with development of neurological manifestations. Patient could be having a development of a reversible dementia. Patient could have had a de development of cerebellar symptoms as well. But B12 deficiency is likely to be responsible for causing a macrocytic or a megaloblastic anemia, not a microcytic anemia, right? So two questions I'm saying. Morning session. Just gastric resection, previous gastric surgery and the type of deficiency. And the second question, second session was with regards to B12 deficiency responsible for what kind of manifestation. So this is, of course, responsible for causing a development of something like a megaloblastic anemia. Right. Hanji, Hanji. That is what I'm saying, Dr. Gul. So then the question was making a mention of a patient who was having a hemoglobin, which was low, 7 gram. It was have, he, the patient was having a high TLC count, around 50K or so, which was mentioned. And a uh, repeat of what we had talked about, altered coagulation profile. So prothrombin time was elevated, activated partial thrombo time was elevated, D-dimers were present, all suggestive of the fact that the patients were having DIC. And it also had an image which had the presence of something which is resembling the AOR rods, or some people said multiple of them were present, so faggot cells. So you make a tentative diagnosis of a patient suffering from acute promyelocytic leukemia. But the question was about the kind of genetic information or the pathogenesis which was associated in these patients. Right. So this is what is going to be associated with this. The patient is going to be having a APML. And if a patient is going to be having acute promyelocytic leukemia, of course, you could not be associating it with BCR ABL. Wo translocation 922 CLL and ALL. NPM is something that you find in a patient having acute myeloid leukemia, but that is the one which is going to be having a specific genetic translocation. And PML RARA is the one that is going to be having a high risk of development of DIC. Right. So, of course, this is something that we need to be just having a recap. 